Since we just finished talking about the structure and function of microbes, it's natural to then focus on DNA and protein expression. After all, protein expression and the DNA that controls it is the core of this thing we call life. What we have learned about the workings of living things has made it possible to take that knowledge and improve the human condition in the form of testing and in the creation of powerful drugs. But let's start at the beginning. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, scientists were asking these questions. How does the cell make proteins? How does the cell know which proteins to make? Can we use this information to do something useful from a human perspective? In the next series of lectures, we hope to answer these questions. Today we begin by looking at how a cell makes a protein, what recipes it uses, and how the whole process works. Before we dive into transcription, let's first remind ourselves of the structure of nucleic acids. DNA will fold into a double helix. This helix has a sugar phosphate backbone held together by bases that give it specificity and stability. Each turn of the helix has about 10 base pairs with a length of 3.4 nanometers. Each turn of the helix also has a major groove and a minor groove where other molecules can interact with a specific sequence. And these can be proteins and sometimes other nucleic acids. In this and other biology classes, your teacher told you that RNA contains the sugar ribose while DNA contains deoxyribose in its backbone. And that's missing the two prime hydroxyl. RNA has an adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil, while DNA substitutes thymine for uracil. Now, you've been told about those differences, but have you ever wondered why there are these differences, or why cells have both DNA and RNA? It turns out that the 2' prime hydroxyl is a troublemaker and can cause autocatalytic cleavages at a high enough rate to be a nuisance. In addition, the absence of that 2' prime hydroxyl makes for a wider, shallower groove in the DNA, which is better for protein access. Finally, the lack of an OH makes DNA less rigid and easier to store. This flexibility is essential when you want to organize your chromosome. So what about thymine? Why use it in DNA? All bases can undergo unwanted chemical reactions at some rate. One degradation that cytosine undergoes changes it into a uracil. If that happens, it changes the DNA code, a possible mutation. So how does, how does thymine fix this problem? It's a substitute for uracil, not cytosine. If your DNA molecule encodes thymine to pair with adenine, then when there is a decay event of cytosine to uracil, the repair machinery will know that the uracil is not supposed to be there and will repair it, converting it back to cytosine. So, both DNA and RNA have their place. DNA is double-stranded. Having DNA to double strand provides a second copy of the information, allowing many of the repair mechanisms to function. Double strands also protect the bases from chemical attacks. The lack of a 2' prime hydroxyl makes it more stable and flexible. This is thus it's easier to wrap around stuff like histones to store it. RNA is involved in translating DNA into protein. These are all temporary messages in the form of messenger RNA. RNA also carries out some catalytic reactions. The ribosome has RNA that carries out its core activity, manufacturing protein. Many of these catalytic reactions require the activity of the 2' prime hydroxyl of RNA. tRNA is the adapter molecule between nucleic acids and amino acids. And other RNA molecules are involved in other activities such as ribozymes and riboswitches. We are still learning all the functions these molecules have. 
Finally, the twists, loops, and open strands of the RNA are recognized by various proteins and are important in the functioning of the process. RNA is therefore often single and double-stranded to carry out its function. All right, let's think a little bit about the double-stranded regions of DNA. As we have discussed, A pairs with T and G pairs with C when forming the double strand. A DNA double helix is a very stable structure, but what makes it stable? The hydrogen bonds between A, T, and G, C give the DNA helix its specificity, but they are not the primary force stabilizing the DNA. Look at the base stacking structure on the right. The close association of the base pairs that stack upon one another creates favorable van der Waals forces, and these contribute significantly to its stability. Base stacking is the major force that holds DNA together. Another important fact is that DNA and RNA are directional. DNA and RNA have start sequences and stop sequences, and processing is always 5' prime to 3'. Prime. This directionality is true for all reactions involving them, be it replication, transcription, or translation. Also, the DNA strands are anti-parallel to each other, with the 5' prime to 3' prime strand on each side pointing in the opposite direction. Many students who are in early stages of grappling with the central dogma will have the misconception that DNA is double-stranded and RNA is single-stranded. While it is true that RNA does take the form of single-strand in some cases, it is also true that many RNA molecules in the cell are double-stranded. As shown on this figure, transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA will have the majority of their sequence base pairing to form a double strand. Even messenger RNA will have secondary structure where parts of it will be double stranded before it is translated by the ribosome. DNA size. Genomes can be of many different sizes, and the genome size does not always correlate with the complexity of the organisms. The smallest known genome is that of Carcinella ruddii, an intracellular endosymbiont of the sap-sucking insect Pachycilla venusta. The genome contains just enough central monotonous genes for the bacterium to make its proteins, but curiously, many of them are amino acid biosynthesis genes. This strange bias makes perfect sense because the role of this bacterium for its host is to synthesize amino acids. The insect's diet is all carbohydrates and very little protein, so it has to be able to get its amino acids from somewhere, and it uses this endosymbiont. The average bacterium, such as E. coli, has a genome of about 4 million base pairs and about 4,000 genes. Humans have about 3 billion base pairs and about 21,000 genes. The largest known genome belongs to Amoeba dubia, a protozoan, which is more than 684 billion base pairs. Clearly, there is no correlation between genome size and organism complexity. So ends our discussion of RNA and DNA. Now we move on to the central dogma, specifically talking about transcription.